Good morning, church. Please rise up and join us in worship. From the highest throne to the earth below, you laid down your life for the likes of us. Great is the love of the Savior. From a wounded heart to a life made whole, every human heart will declare as one. Great is the love of the Savior. Lord of endless life, let your Just a couple of announcements. I know some of you had adopted a compassion child a few months back. I got my first compassion letter, so very exciting. Um, just wanted to remind everybody who did adopt a child or sponsor a child, you can go online and write them a letter right there, and then you can read your letter back from them online. So we don't have to pay for postage and all of those things. It's just really cool, very quick and easy, super user-friendly. Um, but you do get the actual letter. This came a little while ago, but I got the physical letter in the mail too, which is really cute. She drew me a picture. Just wanted to share 
that my girl's favorite subject is mathematics. She lives with her father, mother, and brother. She loves the color pink. Yay. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and her favorite song is Strong Fortness. Maybe Fortress. You know, there's always some, <laughs> some translation issues. Um, this month for Operation Christmas Child, just a reminder every month if you're able to collect items to help us gather them for our November packing party. So if you find, I know Walmart had a ton of clothing on sale for like a dollar. So if you have a little extra cash and you're there and you see things from, you know, toddler size all the way up to men's and women's mediums probably, those would work. Um, big t-shirts are fine. So you can bring those and put them in the back. And then we do have a poster in the back this Saturday. We are going to be serving the uh, first responders at Country Thunder. So that's the 23rd. I believe we have enough helpers. I believe the food is all taken care of. So if you could just sign the poster as a thank you to them and then be praying that there'll be opportunities for us to share. And then any money that you would like to donate to help with the cost of the food, um, you can talk to John Bixler or Amy afterwards. And then I'm just going to pass around this fellowship clipboard so that we can have good eats next week. And then I'll have Randy come up for offering. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Two young volunteers. <laughs> Any volunteers, I guess that thing is. So, um, oh, we're not doing the offering. I'm going to do a magic trick. I'm going to make <laughs> I'm going to make you disappear. Do you think you're doing the offering? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> it's like, mom, dad, help me. All right, great. All right, let's pray for the offering. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for just another awesome day you give us to serve you, Lord. We just thank you for everyone here today, Lord, and there's many that aren't. We just pray that you'd be with them, and whatever they're doing, Lord, whatever situation they're in, just guide and direct them, bring them back here safe to us, and be with Pastor Ivan as he brings a message to you soon, Lord. We just pray that you speak through him and just uh, use him mightily um, to go through your word. And again, as we take this offering, we'd ask that you'd use it for your glory only to pray in your son's most precious name. Amen. Thinking of a call to worship this morning, um, I was flipping through some Bible verses and this bookmark fell out. So I thought, well, this is something to remember. And I don't know about all of you, but I certainly need reminders of the God that we worship and what he means to us and what he does for us. So I'm going to read some of the things that are listed on here. God is the eternal, unique, and separate, self-contained, unified, triune creator of the universe. That gives me goosebumps. God is outside our sphere of time. He's everywhere present. He's all-knowing, all-powerful, and the sovereign Lord who owns everything. God is unchanging, our Father. Both knowledgeable, or both knowable, um, he's relational, and nothing is too hard for him. God is good, and we can trust him with our lives because he wants and works everything for the good of those who love him. God's holiness sets him apart and requires that we must be born again to have a right relationship with him. God is and is the source of truth, and his truthfulness makes it impossible for him to lie. God is our redeemer, and his purpose is to help us. God is merciful. He is merciful to the lost and to the unsaved. He is gracious, and his grace is what saves us from sin and sustains us. God is slow to anger because he does not find joy in punishment. God is loving. His love is what motivated him to send Jesus to save us. And it's the underlying force behind his mercy, grace, and slowness to anger, and what makes our salvation permanent. God is faithful. His, un his faithfulness means he will keep his promises to save us. He'll be faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. And he gives us everything we need to do 
and not what, um, let me reread that. He's faithful to e us even when we are not faithful to him and gives us everything we need to do and not do what he wants us to do and not do. God forgives. His forgiveness covers a variety of offenses. It is complete and permanent. For non-believers, it's contingent on them putting their trust in Jesus Christ alone for their forgiveness and, and relationality for believers. It's contingent on our confession of sin and willingness to forgive others. God is both righteous in what he is and what he does. And he is judicious. And it makes him perfectly just. This is the God that we worship this morning. And there's so much more that we could say about him. But Lord, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for the freedom in our country that we're able to openly worship you, to bring you glory. Also to be reminded of your word, what you would have us do. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your truthfulness, your sovereignty, Lord. We thank you for this time together with other believers, our church family, God. We pray for those that are here in the building, for those that are watching online. We pray that you open our hearts and that we can feel your spirit as you know that we're two or three are gathered in your name, Lord, as we are this morning, that you are here amongst us. That's not something that we should take lightly. Your spirit is here. And we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The day is brighter with you. The night is lighter than it's you would lead me to believe. Which leads me to believe that you make everything glorious. You make everything glorious. You make everything glorious. And I am yours. My eyes are small, but the beauty of the enormous things which leads me to believe there's light enough to see that you make everything glorious you make everything glorious you make everything glorious and I am From glory to glory, you are glorious, you are glorious. From glory to glory, you are glorious, you are glorious. From glory to glory, you are glorious, you are glorious.
nothing worth more that will ever come close. No thing can compare your living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone in your presence Lord. holy spirit you are welcome here come fly that you fill us, fill us with your Holy Spirit this morning. Help our hearts and our minds and our ears hear the words that Pastor Ivan is going to share with us today. Let those words come straight from you and go straight to our hearts, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us so we can see you wherever we go, so we can 
look at people and help them find you too, Lord. We pray all this in your precious son's name. Our worship services are a team effort. <laughs> we appreciate everyone who's involved from the work that's done and back on the soundboard, video, audio, uh, to the worship team. Give us all the opportunity to just open up our hearts to the Lord to hear what he has for us. And I appreciate everyone who's here and your participation. And our singing together and our worship together, we experience that oneness uh, that the Lord talks about. And it's special and beautiful and I'm so grateful to be able to share that with you. Uh, please pray with me. Father, let's speak about opening our hearts to you, God. It, it can be a scary thing when you start to go in there and tinker around in areas that we rather uh, you not touch. If we're to grow, if we're to be healthy, well, we need the great physician to operate on us. Lord Jesus, we pray this morning that you would do so. Uh, Father, would, that you would equip us with tools that enable us to open up our hearts, our emotions to you. But Lord, even above that, that you would give us the courage to be able to do so. In your name, amen. amen. Amy and I are going through a book called Pitch Anything. And in this book, it gives you all the tools and tricks that you will ever need in order to sell anything. And this morning, I want to not use the tips and tricks used in the book because those are more in a business setting. But this morning, I want to try and sell you on the importance of having a healthy heart. And by having a healthy heart, I mean being complete in not only our body and our spirit, but also within our emotions. God has created us as emotional beings. And rather than just allow our most emotions to passively control us, I want to give you some reasons, uh, uh, some, some biblical reasons as to why this is important, and then some practical steps uh, that you can do at home in order to begin the journey of having a, a healthy heart. Who's this sermon series for? Uh, there's about uh, five people that jump to, in my mind when I think of who this sermon series is for. The first person, those who are easily upset. Those who are easily upset. Anyone? No one? Seinfeld, season six, episode 24. Remember that scene? Oh no, my Frankfurter fell. <laughs> in the episode on the understudy, uh, Seinfeld was finding himself in a bit of a quandary because his girlfriend was easily upset. Uh, her hot dog fell, and it just completely ruined her day. I guess you can kind of understand that. Good hot dog. <laughs> but she was so easily upset that it was difficult for him to know how, how, how he ought to care for her in their relationship. And perhaps you're this way. Somebody rubs you the wrong way, and, and it, from those who are on the outside, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. But you're able to go from zero to 60 with no problem in two seconds. That is uh, unhealthy emotionally. When you're so easily upset, when, when, when outside forces are able to change your demeanor with the, in the drop of a hat, in the snap of a finger. 
If you find that you're unable to control your emotion, that you're easily upset, I think this would be beneficial for you. It's also for those who are emotional bullies. What does an emotional bully look like? It's somebody who manipulates people's emotions in order to get what they want. A friend of mine, dear brother, pastor, pastor of church for several years, been involved in ministry uh, more than he's more of his life than he can than he's not been. About, about forty years of ministry. But he was easily upset when when you know you have a bunch of teenagers who are not listening to him, not paying attention, and he would blow up. And he would use this as a means to control. He would use his anger as a means to control, to manipulate. And it was emotional bullying to, to say, I know what I can do to control you. I'm going to yell at you. Some people are emotional bullies passively. Well, I'm just going to do what you say, but I'm not going to say anything. You know, inside, uh, I'm building up resentment towards you. And one day, that resentment is going to come out. Maybe it's going to come out in the divorce. Maybe it's going to come out in, in, uh, in uh, uh, yelling all night long. Maybe it'll come out in an act of violence. People use emotions to bully other people. If you find yourself to be using emotions to get what you want, either your reaction towards things or you're manipulating other people's emotions to get what you want, then I think this series would be beneficial for you. The third person that I think of is those who are controlled by their emotions. We all have emotions. We all have bad days. I, I think everyone gets depressed every once in a while. And I'm not guaranteeing you that if you follow these steps, you will be happy and healthy and all the time. You'll still get upset. You'll still have sad days. You'll still have anger. St but these things won't control you anymore. You'll learn tips and tricks to control them rather than be controlled by it. So if you find that your emotions are controlling you, I think this might be of benefit to you. The fourth person that I think of is those who want to be free. Perhaps because of your uh, emotion, emotional overdrive, you've lost relationships. Maybe you find yourself being controlled by other people. And, and you ever say this? I just can't say no. Well, you can say no, and we'll teach you how. And then everyone's going to hate you. <laughs> no, they won't. Not yet. <laughs> no. It's OK to say no, by the way. It really is OK to tell people no, to tell kids no, to tell friends no. Uh, they may not like it at, the, at that time, but they don't like it because they're trying to use emotions to control you. You need to learn to say no. A dear sister of ours, people were taking advantage of her left and right, and she just wouldn't say no. Family members sucking up all her money. But she just could not find it within her to say no, even though it was ruining her life. She needed freedom, freedom from that bondage of, of not being able to say no. Maybe you need freedom from anger. Maybe you need uh, freedom uh, from, from just feeling down all the time. You can be free. And by free, I don't mean that you're never going to have a bad day, but that you'll know how to manage things so that you're not controlled by your emotions anymore. And you'll be able to put things in their proper perspective. And the last person I think of is those who want to grow. Maybe your experience has been different than mine, but when I first came to Christ, right, those first couple years, you go from like, you know, newborn in, in Christ to like a mature adult. It's, it's like, uh, it's like the, the old movie from Tom Hanks, Big, right? You grow into an adult overnight. 
And for me, I was in the pressure cooker, which allowed me to experience about 10 years worth of church in six months. But then you kind of hit a plateau where, where you, know, you don't see miracles like you were and you're not feeling the spirit and the word's just not jumping at you like it used to. You kind of feel like you hit this plateau and, the, and then you have moments of growth and then plateau. And, and these are part of the experience, but if you've been in a plateau for a while, perhaps the next step in your life is to, get, is to grow emotionally because spiritual and emotional growth go hand in hand. Say in a different way, you will never grow as you ought to spiritually if you're not growing emotionally. There is no spiritual growth aside from emotional growth. In Galatians, we're told that uh, one of the works of the flesh is anger. And if you're prone, i am just using anger because it's easy. It comes, it comes to my mind because it's just something simple that I think we've all experienced internally, externally. But if you're prone to bursts of anger, that's an area in your life that needs growth. And other areas may be doing well as well, but you'll never grow the way you ought to grow if you're not growing emotionally. Spiritual growth and emotional growth Go hand in hand. Why pursue a healthy heart? Because God made you to have a healthy heart. First thing that I want to share with you is from Psalm 139, verse 14. You didn't think I'd get to the Bible, did you? I was going to be like last Sunday. <laughs> that was a swing and a miss. You know, sometimes, sometimes you hit a home run, sometimes it's a strikeout. Here's what the Bible says, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 14, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. And this is the scripture. I'm not thanking him. It's not like the Pharisee, thank you for who you made me. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well do I know? It? And I love this image because it shows both the beauty of the created order and the beauty of us as humans. God made your beautiful heart. <laughs> he made you to experience emotions. He, he himself expresses emotions. And he wants you to experience, ex experience him not just in the things that he does for you, but he wants you to have an emotional experience with him. Uh, it boggles my mind sometimes when there's this separation of emotional and intellectual as if a church that uh, is, ex is experiencing uh, God emotionally is inferior to a church that is experiencing him intellectually. And I understand the extremes of the two, right, where you can be way too emotional and way too intellectual. But the two come together. Uh, and how God has made you, he's made you intellectual, and he's made you emotional, and he wants you to experience him through both. The, through the funny emotions and through the not so funny emotions. During a dark time in my life, some years back, as I was complaining and griping, which I do a little less of now, it's not eliminated, but it's less. I just felt like God was telling me, you're being like Jesus. And I don't hear that as often as I would like to hear it. But in my willingness to suffer injustice and in my open heart to God in that terrible situation, and my emotional uh, temperature was at a low, but that brought me great comfort even in the midst of that difficult situation to know that I am being like Jesus. The Word of God tells us that Jesus was a man of sorrow, a quinter grief. He, he's emotionally complex, and the next two sermons we're going to look at specific passages relating to Jesus and emotions. But he experiences God through, through it all, both in the joys of, of healing someone, Zacchaeus, right? Great celebration took place, and in the, in the despair of Gethsemane. 
God made you who you are. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are not a mistake. You are not an accident. He was very intentional in the way he made you. And would you do me a favor? Stop telling yourself those lies that you are a mistake or an accident or that something's wrong with you. There's something wrong with all of us as the corrosive power of sin. For while we are fearfully and wonderfully made, we live in a world that is under the power of sin. That means we can't even trust ourselves. The book of Romans tells us this. Romans 5.12 5, uh, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. Here's the, the mental image that the Apostle Paul is painting for us in the book of Romans. It's the image of Adam opening a door. And sin is, is personified here like a person. It's spoken of like a person. And when, that, when Adam sinned, he opened that door. You may call it Pandora's box or whatnot. But sin enters into this world, but he doesn't come by himself. He's got an entourage. He's got a posse. Uh, sin comes with death and all kinds of other evils. So that God's original intent for this world is now corrupt and corroded to the world that we experience now. We live in a world that is under the power of sin. But sin is still a foreign object to us. It's not native to the original creation. But sin enters into this world, and we are under the power of sin. So all these negative emotions that you are experiencing, although they can be used by God to help you grow in him, nevertheless, they don't come from him. He is not making you depressed. He is not making you sad. Sin that is present in this world is expressing itself in these different ways. And it's really important for us to get a hold of this. In my daily experience, I'm not always thinking, oh, man, this morning, I, it, you know, uh, Susie, I mentioned earlier how uh, the humidity, what, what was it you said? Air you can wear. Air you can wear. <laughs> the humidity is air you can wear. Sin is that way. It's like humidity, and it just blankets us. One day God's going to do away with it, though. Amen. It's not permanent. It's temporary. It's part of this world order, not the world order that's to come. Revelation tells us that there's a day coming where he's going to wipe away every tear from our eye, and there will be no more death and no more sorrow, for the former things have passed. These negative things that you're experiencing have their focus in sin. And you may have a biological propensity uh, towards negative emotions. But even with a biological propensity, you can still gain control over them. But we'll never gain control if we don't realize that these things have their origin in sin. Not that you're sinning because you're experiencing these, but that these things like depression and sorrow and sadness, they come from death. They don't come from life. They come out of the corrosive power of sin. But Jesus restores. Amen. Jesus restores. Second Corinthians 5.17 says, anyone who belongs to Christ how do you belong to Christ? The Word of God tells us that you belong to Christ when you decide to follow Him. And you decide to follow Him when, when you realize who He is and what He has done for you. When you realize that He is uh, the Son of God who has come into this world, who embodied flesh, He left the glories of heaven to slum it with us here on earth, in order to redeem us from the power of sin. And think of this great, incredible act of love. For a friend, for a family member, we will willingly do things. How many of us would do something for the leader of the political party who's on the opposite side? Any hands? 
Anyone? Guess what? In God's eyes, you're that person to him. As much disdain as you may have, and I use politics because that really gets people fired up. As much disdain as you have for the leader of the opposite party, God could have had more so towards you. And justifiably so. It's not as if he doesn't have a reason. I give him reasons every day for him to hate me. And he just, he just won't. So, Lord, I've done everything possible that I could do to get you to hate me. And yet, the more I try to get you to hate me, the more you love me. You are that person that you have a high level of disdain for. That's you. But Jesus put it this way. He shares a parable of a, uh, of a person who, who, who ran up an incredible amount of debt in the millions. He goes to the king and says, give me time. I need more time. He could have paid it off in three lifetimes. The king's merciful said, you know what? I'm going to forgive your entire debt. Right? So let's, in this scenario, you're the person who's forgiven. Then you go to the person who owes you a little debt, five bucks, and you start shaking them, give me my five dollars. And you throw him in jail for the debt that he owes you till, till he pays it all off, which I would assume in jail it's very hard to make an income. <laughs> That's the level of ingratitude that we have. We, we are takers. He's the giver. And through his giving, we can become givers because Jesus restores. Praise God that we are not what we used to be. And it doesn't matter whether you came to Christ when you're this tall or you're this tall or this hunched over. We are not what we used to be because Jesus restores. He is a master craftsman who's able to take an old, ugly piece of wood and make it beautiful. As we were singing earlier, he makes everything glorious. And he made you glorious. And through the power of Christ, he restores you. And that gives us great hope in our emotional growth that tells us that we can be free say that with me i can be free come on you're not saying that i can be free everyone now come on i can be free and i want you to say that because i want you to start believing that and i know that 20 minutes on a sunday morning is not going to convince you but I really hope that you begin to uh, just allow this to sink into your mind and into your heart to, this, to that place that keeps saying you can't be free. That, 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 those guards and those walls that, that say, no, you can't be free. Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And for some, perhaps online or here present, everything within your body right now is saying, no, you cannot be free. And that voice inside your head it sounds so much like your own that you've believed it to be you. But that is not the voice of the Spirit. The Word of God tells us in Romans chapter 8 that, who, that, that the Spirit sets us free. The mind of the, that's set on things of this world, that's the mind set on death. But the mind that's set on things above, there's freedom and there's joy, and there's emotional victory. Even in the dark days, Jesus restores. And while Jesus restores, there's still work for us to do. While Jesus restores, we're now working out the process of that restoration in our lives. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13 says this, Dear friends, you always followed my instructions, the Apostle Paul writes, when I was with you, and now that I, I'm, and now that I'm away, it is even more even more important. Work hard on showing the results of your salvation, obeying God with a deep reverence and fear, for God is working in you, giving you uh, the desire and, and the power to do what pleases Him. That verse reminds me that it's not up to me. Praise God. I don't have to depend on my intellect 
my ingenuity, my tools, my savvy. It doesn't depend on me. And while I'm a willing participant in the part process, it, it doesn't all depend on me. You are not alone in this process. You are not by yourself. It's not all dependent on you. And, and that is so liberating because what have I, when things are left up to me, I ruin them. If it all depended on me, and if I was so good, I wouldn't have to measure twice or four times <laughs> or six times or eight times. I kid you not, that has happened. <laughs> He measures once, cuts once. He knows what he's doing. He is, as we saw in the Psalms and uh, as we saw in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job, he's infinitely wise. He knows exactly what he's doing. But we still have, we're still participants in the process. When he talks about work out your salvation, it's not earn your salvation. It's work out now the results of what you got. It's the difference between a wedding day and a marriage. Sometimes people spend so much money and energy on a, on a wedding day. I mean, one contractor that was coming to fix our house, he told us of a friend of his who spent $70,000 on their wedding, and they were divorced within six months. Oh. All right? I could have had a Tesla with that money. <laughs> <laughs> so many other things I could have done. With. That's a lot of money to spend for six months. But they spent so much energy and time on the wedding day, they apparently forgot that there's a marriage that follows that day. Our wedding day was the day that we said, yes, Jesus, I will follow you. That's the day that you got married to Jesus. In fact, the Word of God uses that language uh, of a husband and a bride. But that's just the beginning. Now you have to work at the marriage throughout your life. It's... It's like when you start to learn baseball, grabbing a bat doesn't mean you're a baseball player. But through time and energy and effort, as you continue to work at it, you become a baseball player. So it is with us. The day that we said, yes, Jesus, did everything get fixed in our lives? I wish it did. <laughs> I wish my bank account was healed that day. <laughs> the Lord would just lay some hands on it. <laughs> No, but that was the beginning of my new life in Jesus. It was the beginning of a beautiful life in Jesus. And I'll tell you that greatest decision I've made, Jesus, following Jesus, and Mary and Amy. And you guys are a close third. <laughs> a close third. The day that you believed in Christ was the day that you gave yourself permission to be free. That's the day that you said, Lord, I want you in my life. I want you to work on me. But it was just the beginning. You need to work out the results of the decision that you've made. And it's a lifelong journey. There's never a point where you have mastered it, but you can continue to grow. There's never a point where you have heard it all. If you've heard it all and applied it all, you're good. But if you're imperfect like me, that doesn't work. I was teasing somebody. That I, Lord and I, we, I thought we had an agreement of a two-week period for me from the day I preach to when I have to live out what I preach. Like I should have at least a two-week flex period that says, you know what, I don't have to live this out at least till the 14th or whatever. Nope. <laughs> No two-week period. He expects me to live out what I preach like right away, even before I preach it. So unreasonable. <laughs> this is the process of working things out. How do you get there? Let's talk a little bit in, towards, uh, as we begin to close, about the hard work of a healthy heart. The hard work of a healthy heart. And the information that follows comes from uh, Mark Allen uh, Shel Shel Shelk's book. Uh, it's in, the book is titled The Wisdom of Your Heart, Discerning 
uh, discovering the God-given purpose and power of your emotions. It's a great resource. If you, if you want to pick it up, I'd recommend it to you. He does an excellent job describing how God ministers to us in our hearts. And in this book, chapter 17, he gives some advice on how to begin the journey of em towards emotional health. He goes by saying, learn to pay attention. Learn to pay attention. By this, he means begin to be proactive about your emotions rather than passive. Ask yourself questions. Uh, uh, he, he, in this chapter, he talks about developing a process for understanding your emotions. And it begins by, he uses five A's. The first is attend, attend. By this, he means uh, pay attention to your emotions and begin to ask yourself questions. A great way to do this is by journaling. He says he began to do this by journaling, but uh, over time, he's able to do this mentally. But journaling is a great way to write yourself uh, clear. It's, it's, just, it's amazing how just sitting down and writing out your experience can help bring clarity. And if you do it with a fountain pen, it's even better. It feels better anyway. I don't know if it is better, but it feels better. But you, you, have, you know, somebody rubs you the wrong way, you begin to ask, why do I feel the way that I do? What, what is my body, what's my body experiencing? How are my emotions attached to this? Begin to ask yourself a question. Be attentive to your emotions. Then begin to articulate. There, there's a, a sheet that he has that lists different emotions uh, I think he has about 10 different emotions listed. There's a, a book, I forget the name of, of the book, but it has a, a list of all the emotions that we experience, and there's 300 plus emotions. The, the beauty of, of being able to name it is that it puts an identity on it. Even Jesus, when he approached a man who was demon possessed in Mark chapter 5, he asked him, What is your name? And in the name, this, the name describes who it is. It says we're a legion, for we are many. So in getting his name, Jesus knows who he's dealing with. And, in know, and knowing how, who he's dealing with, he's able to then uh, know how to approach the situation. One of the worst things that could ever happen to you is when you go to a doctor, the doctor says, I don't know. Anyone ever experienced that? That's terrible. <laughs> I need a name for what I'm experiencing, doctor. So don't give me this, I don't know, make it up. Make me feel better, make it up, do something. It's terrible when you go to a medical professional, he's like, I don't know what you got. Because then that leaves, that leaves the question mark, it leaves it unknown, and then you have no idea how to deal with it. But when a label is attached to it, then you're able to deal with it. So it is with our, our emotions and our body, the things that we're experiencing, when we attach labels to it, then we're able to better understand what's going on. And it, it gives us then a, 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 a pathway for emotional health. So we attend, we articulate, articulate, we ask, ask questions. Why do I feel this way? What's going on? Uh, Mark Allen in his book shares a story in which a, a friend of his had asked him about a, a situation that he had committed to, something that he had committed to do, as friend had, had asked him. And he recounts feeling angry that his friend asked, to the point where he felt that his friend, that if his friend couldn't trust him to do what he had asked, that he wasn't sure whether or not they could be friends. So he separates himself and he begins, he goes through the process of writing things out. Why was I angry? Because anger comes out of feeling violated. Was I violated? No. And through the process of asking himself questions, and he says the first emotion is usually never uh, the right one. The first emotion is usually never the right one. And he said as he prayed and asked for clarity from the Holy Spirit, and a uh, verse that I was tempted to use where it says, Search me, O God, and know my thoughts. That process of searching, uh, it, you're active in that process as you ask these questions, ask for the Spirit to give you guidance and insight. He was able three days later to conclude that he f had that anger 
because he found much of his identity in doing things for people. And thus questioning him uh, as to whether or not he had uh, done the thing that he said he was going to do made him feel less valued because he found uh, much of his value in doing things for people. So for him, it wasn't about anger. It was about baggage that he had that he was bringing to the relationship. He says, and it wasn't fair for me to bring this baggage uh, to, to, uh, uh, to impose this on my friend. It took him a few days to realize that it was his own personal baggage that was creating that response and not anything wrong that his friend had done. His friend had proven to be a trust, trusting, loving, kind friend uh, for years. But going through this process, attend, articulate, asking, uh, uh, to, to uh, say, uh, as, as uh, we said in the car, it's, it's like foghorn, like on, uh, say, uh, say, uh, say. <laughs> it, it assess the emotion, whether or not it, it need, you need to invest more emotion into it, whether you could just let it go. I, I think it's assess, but you just need another A word, and so we went with the say. But you're assessing your heart in the process, and then you act on it. You apply. Uh, application could be something like, I don't need to do anything about this. I don't need to pursue this anymore. Uh, application could be realizing that I'm reacting this way out of my own personal insecurities, so the issue is not the other person, but the issue is me. And then you start to work on those insecurities. You, don't, you acknowledge them, but you don't just say, well, that's just the way I am. But you do the hard work of, uh, of all this emotional junk. And it may, be, it may be incredibly difficult at first. And it may bring up emotions that, that you have buried, emotions that you don't want to deal with uh, because they're really hard to, to, uh, to face. But guess what? They're not going anywhere by themselves. By themselves, they're not going anywhere. And they will keep you in bondage, the, the more you ignore them, the more control they will have over you. You can't ignore them. You can't put them in the closet and expect them to they, stay there. And what, what they do is that they come out in the most, uh, um, the most uh, uh, inappropriate time, where you have all your guests home for Thanksgiving, and, and things are going right with the turkey, and then all of a sudden, you just blow up. And people are like, whoa, what's going on here? Those, those emotions that you've been bottling, it's not like water, but it's more like soda. And, and you're just shaking the can, shaking the can, and then when you go to open it, it explodes. But even in that, just finding that release can begin the process of healing. God created your beautiful heart, and he wants you to have a healthy heart. In order to have a healthy heart, we have to do the hard work to get that healthy heart. And these, uh, diff these five A's can help us get on that road to gaining a healthy heart. But I want to close with a question that Jesus asked uh, someone who asked to be healed. Jesus walking around the road, Jesus, son of David, he, he says, uh, heal me. Or he cries out to Jesus, he's blind. Jesus says, do you want to be well? That's an important question. Wellness would mean letting go of how he used to gain money. Right? He was dependent on people's generosity and kindness. Now, he had, now that has to change. It means letting go of all the sympathy that he got for being blind. It means letting go of his current lifestyle. But in letting go, he gains so much more. But Jesus asked him the question that I want to ask you. Do you want to be well? If the answer is yes, then you have to do the hard work in order to get a healthy heart. Let's pray.
Father, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, but we are also in a world that is under the power of sin. Yet, Jesus, you restore. You make all things glorious, and you're making us glorious. As Paul says that even though outwardly we are fading away, yet inwardly we can be renewed day by day. Part of that inward renewal, Lord, is to be able to control our emotions. And, it, and it's hard work. But God, you give the grace and the wisdom and the insight to be able to have healthy hearts. So God, we pray that you give us willing hearts to have healthy hearts. In your name. One of the ordinances of the church is uh, communion. It's something that we uh, we uh, share uh, once a month. You don't have to be a, a member of Grace Bible Church to participate in communion. Or Grace, either one. You don't have to be a member of Grace either. Or New Life. I'm getting all kind of emotions right now. <laughs> Just need a minute. <laughs> You don't have to be a, a member of any church other than the body of Christ. Amen. Uh, the word church is, is uh, ecclesia is the, the Greek word, and it means those who are gathered in Jesus' name. And that is the church that we are a part of. The Bible says that when we say yes to Jesus, when we acknowledge who he is, what he has done, and say, Lord, I will follow you. The Word of God says that by His Spirit, He incorporates us into His body. And this is a worldwide body made up of people from all walks of life, all kinds of all ages and heights and race and colors and creeds. But I've said yes to Jesus. And as a body, we observe communion once a month to reflect on what Jesus has done in order to gain victory. In the Word of God in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Word of God says this, For I pass out to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, that's such a, such a, a vivid phrase, the night that he was betrayed. Of all the things that he could have been doing, if you knew you were going to be betrayed this night, what would you be doing? You probably, I would assume, if you're like me, hopefully you're not, <laughs> you would be doing everything you can to stop that betrayal. Yet Jesus, rather than stopping the betrayal, he stops to have a meal with his disciples, with those whom he loved. And at this meal, the night that he was betrayed, the Lord took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. And he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this as often, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink. This time, I'd like to invite you to participate with uh, myself and others in communion by coming up and grabbing symbols of the body and blood of Jesus. And we have um, gluten-free options for you uh, as well. So I'd like to invite you at this time to come up and to receive uh, the bread and the juice as symbols of the body and blood of Jesus.
One of the things I find beautiful about communion, it's a, it's a corporate sharing in the sufferings of Christ. And we as one family, we are participating in the symbols of the gospel. But the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Let's do that together right now. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. I could. 
of our hearts. Help us to long for you to change us, to shape us, to grow us, so we can be all that you have created us to be. In Jesus' name. <laughs> 